you need to go and see a dietitian because your health is terrible. I was shocked. 9% of the US uh, population, they fall into the eating disorder and also 10,200 deaths each year because of it. Um, and the more our metabolism is trying to slow us down from losing more weight, the less energy we expend. Holly Baxter is a dietitian, science educator, and a leading figure in the nutrition and fitness industry with over 13 years of experience. Holly is not just an expert in her field, but also a professional physique athlete, boasting two world championship level wins in the natural fitness division. She has dedicated her career to providing evidence-based education to her clients and followers around the world. You know, I had had enough. I kind of felt like I had to be perfect at everything. Uh, so I'd say I was a perfectionist, a people pleaser. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I did everything right. Meanwhile, like up here in my mind, you know, hated every single part of me. You know, there's lots of things that you can do, I think, proactively to start recognizing that you are more than just your body. Just screaming, yeah, I will eat some some shit today, but tomorrow I'll go and make nice exercise and it'll be, it all will be gone, you know? So is it is it true or not? You can, but it's very difficult to, to do and not many people are very effective at it. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Holly, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I am excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so are we. I wanted to go ahead and start off by congratulating you on your upcoming event. So I understand you have a two-day event on August 14th and 15th in Las Vegas for the Ultimate Women's Health and Fitness Summit. Mm -hmm. My first question to you is how much of a headache is it organizing an event like this? It's funny. So I've done a couple of these internationally before, but I have not been the event coordinator. This time around, <laughs> I am the event coordinator and I have been tearing my hair out, to be honest. But you know what? It's, it's such a good cause. Uh, I think when we do finally get to execute this uh, and I think, you know, you see people's reactions uh, and the amount of learning that's going to go on, I think, uh, over the two days, it will be worth it. But it's definitely a lot more stressful. Uh, and like the financial commitments, too. I don't know for anybody that's listening, mm. if you've never hosted an event like this, to get a big venue that will cater to, you know, 200 plus people, we're talking like in the tens and thousands just for the venue, let alone, you know, compensating your speakers. And obviously, the higher up the caliber, the more expensive the speakers are, too. So it's, it's been in a, uh, an event. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really commend you on putting on an event because I don't think most people realize just how stressful it is. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we were naive back in the day <laughs> and we ran two of one, uh, we ran one event, uh, like, I don't know, back like four or five years ago. And then we ran another event the next year. It was chaos. I mean, like from a logistics standpoint of view, from a financial standpoint of view, it is so much stress. Yes, at the end of the day, it is definitely worth it. But that's <laughs> as soon as I saw that, I wanted to say like, congrats, because that is it's it's not as easy as it seems. There's a lot of things going on. Oh, I know. Uh, but um, how, how many people are you excited. anticipate to come? So we've booked a venue for 200 people, but we're also going to be hosting it live. Uh, we think we will be able to fill out the audience, but it's, it's, I think since COVID, the, the delivery of education, I think is changing. You know, more people are expected and used to their content being provided through audio, audible books, podcasts, YouTube. So I think 
you know, it's harder to draw people out of their homes these days. But I, I think there are a lot of diehard fans and people that really do want that experience. Um, so we're very hopeful. And I think the calibre of uh, educators that are coming to the event are top notch. I mean, I, we've really searched for the most well-known individuals and then also the researchers too. So uh, hopefully it's a full house. <laughs> Yeah. And by the way, for anyone listening, we did, I did check up your lineup. They look incredible. You have amazing guests coming up. And of course you can check out uh, Holly's website or Instagram social channels to go ahead and learn more about our event. Now, Holly, I want to ask, how did you first become interested in fitness and nutrition? <laughs> so I started out, I guess, as a, a young kid, pretty sporty, very athletic. So, I mean, the question of was I going to be doing sport as an adult was kind of undeniable. But uh, I think to kind of move into the, the physique bodybuilding sport, you know, that was certainly not something that I had envisioned as like a young girl. Uh, but there is certainly a lot of, uh, I guess, experiences and events um, that specifically led me to being in, you know, in that industry. But um, to give you some backstory, I guess, as you mentioned, um, my undergrad is in food science, nutrition, and then I went on and did a master's in dietetics. Um, but I, I was really, really interested, I think, in just being able to help people. Um, and I knew that that was going to extend to people that are really motivated, um, they're committed, they're dedicated to whatever it is that they do. I don't care what it is that you do do. Um, but if I can help you in any way through nutrition or exercise, um, then I'm, I'm your girl. Uh, so I, I actually started out in the clinical space. So when I graduated, I was uh, working as a clinical dietitian for a while and part of my practice. So I went on and had a, a private practice in Australia. Um, but I, I found that the types of individuals that I was working with uh, in that setting were quite different to me. So um, you know, they were often referrals. Uh, we worked with, you know, multiple different allied, you know, health networks. And these people were kind of just being told, you need to go and see a dietitian because your health is terrible. Um, so I'm, I'm getting all these people that would come to see you, but they don't, didn't really want to be there. They weren't necessarily interested mm. or motivated in improving their health, which at the time, you know, I used to think it was quite sad. Like you should be motivated, you know, to be healthy. You've got this one vessel that you are going to have with you for your entire life. Life. Uh, and then there's, there's just these individuals that don't necessarily have the same uh, interest as I did. So I, I kind of ventured out more into the private practice and that was where I really found my niche, I think. Um, you know, the types of uh, people that I was attracting were very growth orientated, um, you know, very into, you know, personal, uh, I guess, responsibility, accountability. They wanted to change. They wanted to be their best self. Um, and, you know, that kind of called for lots of athletes uh, across all different sp uh, fields. Um, and then I also found myself working with professional bodybuilders or physique athletes. Mm. And that was how I got into the industry. I didn't have any experience, you know, at, in, in those sports when I was young. But one of my clients said to me, hey, you know, you're uh, really athletic. Like you probably look like you should be on stage because at the time I was a little bit leaner than this client. I was coaching her to, to compete at a world championships. And uh, she said, you should do this too. And I was like, you know, what? it could be fun. You know, then I've got practical experience for the people that I'm helping. Um, and it was also really motivating because the world championships that year were being held in Dubai. And I loved travel. I think Australians in general, we love to travel. Uh, so that was a, a nice little motivator for me to kind of commit to that process. So I had to win a state show, a national show, uh, and then we could all go and compete for Australia uh, in Dubai. So that was back in 2015. Uh, and I guess a few years have passed since then. So I've done quite a bit in that <laughs> space. But more importantly, um, I've kind of stayed in the scientific space. I think there's a lot of health educators and influencers, um, but few of them, you know, really are ingrained or have strong ties to, you know, the research space and then also sharing evidence-based information. So I think that's probably one of the things that sets me apart a little bit from most people. You know, I've kind of done the practical application of getting into the leanest shape I possibly can. Uh, there are certainly a lot of pros and cons <laughs> to being in that spot, which I can talk about with you today. Um, but I think then also having that science background um, has, has been really, really helpful. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Hey there, before we dive back into the episode, I wanted to stop for just a brief moment and express our heartfelt gratitude. Knowing that you've chosen to spend your time with us to listen and engage with our content truly warms our hearts. Every story we share, every topic we discuss is made much more meaningful if you are here with us on this journey. If you found value in what you've heard so far and you're excited as we are about the episodes to come, we'd be so honored if you'd hit that subscribe button. It not only ensures you stay informed of all of our new content, but it also supports us in continuing to create and share. From all of us here, a sincere thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the episode. I, I would like to, I would like to, uh, just clear for somebody. When Anayat was reading the intro, he said that you are a world championship level wins in a natural fitness division. So what does it mean natural fitness division? Is it different from the regular fitness? Yeah, so I guess when you think about the sport uh, of bodybuilding, uh, obviously that's also a category of bodybuilding, but in general, let's just assume for argument's sake, all of the different divisions that fall under the global umbrella of bodybuilding um, have that kind of title. So mm. I used to compete with the IMBA or PMBA, um, and that is the, I guess, most renowned natural fitness competition that you can do or natural bodybuilding competition. So unlike, you know, uh, the IFBB, for example, um, that's an untested federation. So you have athletes in those um, different uh, divisions that are taking anabolic steroids and things like that. Mm. I've lived a life of, you know, not taking any anabolic steroids mm -hmm. um, and have been able to kind of compete in, in that space. I did for a couple of years compete with um, the IFBB when I was in Australia as a figure competitor. Uh, but again, I was doing that naturally. So when I'd come to like, you know, see the Olympians and compete with others from, you know, all over the world, it was a sport that was well beyond, you know, what I was personally interested in, you know, achieving from an aesthetic mm -hmm. look. So I've kind of stepped into a different federation now that doesn't favor that look. It's not tested, um, but they don't favor a really, you know, overly muscular, you know, female okay. uh, physique. So that's what I mean by a natural uh, world championship wins. Mm -hmm. I see. Let's speak about some misconceptions because when it comes to uh, bodybuilding, there is a lot of misconceptions and I'll read, uh, I have four of them here. So I'll mm -hmm. read one after another, and I would like you to go a little bit deeper to each of the dog. Okay. So mm -hmm. the first one is skipping meals can help you lose weight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that probably falls under the umbrella of just like fasting. So there are so many different types of like fasting techniques that you can employ to facilitate fat loss. Um, I guess there is like the common uh, five and two where you, you know, fast for two days and you eat for five days as normal. Uh, you can do different types of uh, intermittent fasting where it might be, you know, go to 12 hour fast uh, or something like that. There's, there's all kinds. Uh, but I think one of the things to consider with uh, a strategy like this is that when we restrict our caloric intake for a given period of time, we are going to have a hormonal response to that restriction. Uh, we have a decreased leptin, increased ghrelin. So those are our two main appetite regulating hormones. Uh, and the longer we fast, the higher or stronger that signal is for us to eat. So I mean, in my experiences, and I have tried everything just so that I can sit on the fence and say, okay, I've done all these things. Here are the experiences that I have had. And then I also obviously look to the research. Mm -hmm. um, so my blanket statement for any kind of intermittent fasting or skipping meals um, is that it is not better than a, uh, I guess, a normal meal timing dietary approach. So what I mean by that is if you look at, you know, a 12-week study intervention where you've got one group of participants that are consuming, uh, I guess, a certain amount of calories every single day um, and that is being matched with the other group uh, who are eat eating an, a certain or a set amount of calories based on their individual weight and needs. Um, but theirs is, I guess, cycled in the sense that they've got two days where they're completely fasted uh, and then five days where they're consuming calories. There is no difference in the overall amount of weight that is lost. 
One thing that we do see, however, which may not necessarily uh, be a favorable dieting approach when we consider the whole you know, gamut of intermittent fasting, is that it is not effective for retaining lean body mass. So if we think about, you know, our, our protein requirements, so in order to, uh, I guess, optimize the retention of muscle mass, or in the case of, you know, trying to build it, we do need to have a daily supply of protein. Um, we can't store protein, unlike fat or carbohydrate, we can store carbohydrates as glycogen, uh, and that's stored in our liver, in our muscles, also in our, you know, blood, circulating blood. Um, and then fats obviously can be stored as adipose tissue. We can't store protein. So if you are trying to uh, diet in a way that is maximizing fat loss, um, and one of the ways that we can do that effectively is by retaining as much muscle as we can when we diet, um, then we need to make sure that we're able to retain that muscle mass, which is done through protein. Uh, obviously, we also need that stimulus, that mechanical stimulus um, or that metabolic byproduct that builds up through different styles of resistance training. But we need a stimulus, a physical stimulus, and we need to be eating protein. So if you're choosing to fast for days uh, and you're trying to exercise and lift and retain your muscle mass, then you're kind of um, not putting yourself in a favorable position to do that. In fact, what we would see and we do see if we look at, you know, two different, again, we'll give the comparison of two different study groups. One of those groups of participants is fasting, the other is not. What we'll see is greater lean body mass loss in the group that choose to fast because they're not able to retain their muscle mass as well as the group that chose to eat their calories or their protein consistently every single day. And I would say the same argument goes for people that are trying to build muscle too. Um, mm. You know, if you're fasting for long periods of time, you're not getting that protein intake, you're not getting the amino, amino acids available for laying down new tissue and leucine specifically, uh, which is a protein found in animal containing products, um, is the amino acid really signals our muscle to grow. So if you haven't eaten and you haven't got protein available, then you aren't going to be able to signal your muscle to grow. So when it comes to fasting or skipping meals, I'm not a fan. Um, there are certain circumstances where I will say to some individuals, okay, if, it's, if we've got you know, no alternative option, then maybe we try this, but it is not ideal. And I haven't even started on, you know, the, the negative symptoms that come with trying to fast and the mm. hyperphagic response that we might get. And hyperphagia is basically a condition uh, that we will kind of fall into um, after long periods of calorie restriction where our appetite regulating hormones are all out of whack outside the normal reference ranges and they are driving us to eat and eat and eat. Um, and we, by fasting or skipping meals, are putting ourselves in a situation where we desire more food than we actually require. And that is a biological, I guess, uh, a mechanism that is efficacious in many ways. It's protecting us from starvation. From an evolutionary standpoint, we want to have those kind of, uh, you know, boundaries to make sure that we don't just, we can't all just make ourselves starve to death. Um, so... You know, I don't know that I am a big fan of, of fasting, <laughs> but I mean, hey, if it's the it's the only, you know, if it's the only option for somebody, then I'd say, well, sure, if you've tried everything else and you can't do it, maybe we go here. <laughs> what, what, Sorry, what, I missed what, your what, What's your diet look like? Um, I eat three to five meals every day um, pretty consistently, although lately I have been so busy. <laughs> it doesn't quite look quite like that, but it is, um, you know, high protein diet. Um, I'd say it's a balanced diet with an equal amount of remaining calories from carbs and fats. I have a good balance of fun foods, aka alcohol, some drinks here and there, snacks, you know, all the treat type foods everybody likes and enjoys. But I also have a decent amount of nutritious, you know, um, you know, high nutrient rich foods as well. So yeah, there is nothing that I eliminate from my diet. I have all kinds of interesting things which people would probably be surprised to see in my refrigerator. <laughs> but um, you know, everything has a calorie value. So ultimately it's a game of math and then it becomes a game of food preferences. So, you know, if I want to spend my budget on, you know, 80% of those carbohydrates going to, 
candy, maybe I would do that. <laughs> it's probably not the most satisfying if we think about the important role of fiber, um, you know, in our diet for helping with hunger. But, um, you know, everything's got calories. So as provided you are eating at the amount of calories that your individual body requires uh, for your goal, um, then it doesn't really matter how we, we choose our dietary preferences. Mm -hmm. How about how about women uh, with diabetes? Uh, it, it, is there something different over there where maybe, you know, five meals a day is not something suited for them? Or what what does that look like for women that have diabetes? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think, you know, there are always going to be kind of caveats to some of the discussions that we have when we're talking about fat loss or weight gain or, or muscle gain, ideally. Um, but for somebody that has uh, either type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, um, they should actually be managing their conditions through medication. So um, what mm. that means is if they want to be able to consume some carbohydrate-containing foods, then, you know, they would have an appropriate dose of their uh, diabetic medication, something like metformin, for instance, um, and they would have to time that appropriately to ensure that they are able to, uh, I guess, take in that carbohydrate um, mm -hmm. and then have it, yeah. you know, be delivered to the uh, tissues that need that carbohydrate um, for fuel. So my recommendations to somebody that has type 1 or type 2 diabetes honestly don't change a whole lot. What will be mm. efficacious in the case of someone with type 2 diabetes is getting the body fat off. So it's really about, again, finding a, a strategy that will allow them to be consistent, um, that they can stick to indefinitely. And for most people, extreme forms of dieting aren't sustainable. So what we end up right. kind of coming back to is this nice place of moderation where, okay, we've got to find an amount of calories that's going to help you lose body fat. That's the first thing. And then it comes down to, okay, well, do you like carbohydrates or do you prefer more fats in your diet? How does that look? And then, you know, mm. based on their preferences, which allows them to be as, you know, consistent with it, then we time their, um, and we, then we dose their medication appropriately. So mm. that's my response to, to anyone awesome. that might have uh, any of those kind of clinical conditions. I have one more nice um, myth here. You can out exercise a bad diet. So I think whoever listening to us right now who is doing bad diets, they are just screaming, Yeah, I will eat some some shit today, <laughs> but tomorrow I'll go and make nice exercise and it'll be it all will be gone, you know? So is it is it true or not? You cannot out exercise a bad diet. Oh gosh. <laughs> I you know what I've I've tried to uh make this really crystal clear for some individuals. So I mean, you think about, let's say, we'll use the argument of somebody that has their daily energy requirements might be 2,000 calories. I'm just using an arbitrary number. Um, let's say on a given day they decided that they're going to go out with their friends, um, you know, they're going out for pizza. Uh, oh, wait, there's going to be some beers involved or some drinks. Um, oh, by the way, the next day I'm going to be hungover, so I'm probably not going to train. So let's, that's, that's our fictitious character. Right. Um, you may end up consuming, let's say, a thousand additional calories on that given day, um, over and above what your actual energy requirements are. I don't know whether any of you, maybe listening, have have tracked your, uh, I guess, uh, estimated energy expenditure for a, an exercise bout. I do. Now, just because I'm wearing an Apple Watch, it doesn't mean that it's perfectly correct. In fact, if we look at the research behind these calorie estimates for any wrist-worn uh, watches, uh, they tend to be about 30 to 40 percent outside of what's true. So if we put somebody inside a metabolic chamber where everything is being accounted for, um, then we can compare it to what their watch tells them they burned. They're quite quite a bit off and it's usually in the direction that we don't want to hear. It's, they overestimate by about 30 <laughs> oh. or 40%. So I know what I burn when I get on my spin bike. I've got a Peloton at my house and I'll do 30 minute classes here or there. When I absolutely bust my guts, like we are talking true hit, high intensity interval training, where we're doing, you know, inter in, uh, one minute intervals really hard, and then I might have a, a one minute recovery, and then we go again, I might burn 300 calories. So if I chose to do nothing else or make any other changes for the rest of that week to uh, compensate for that additional thousand calories that I ate, I would have I would have to do an additional three and a half 
Peloton ride. So an, an yeah. hour and a half, 90 minutes of extra work that week to basically bring me back to an equal playing field where my energy right. balance is where it was meant to be. So, you know, you can put away a thousand calories so easily. So unless you are willing to do the extra work, um, you know, to make up for the additional calories that you've consumed, um, or you make plans to rem- uh, reduce your calories on other days, um, you know, to m- kind of allow you to have that extra 1,000 calories, which you can do. That's a, a simple concept of calorie cycling. It might mean that of your seven days, you might have five of those at 1,500 and then you've got two at 3,000. You know, you might be able to do that. Right. Um, but that requires conscious thought and it's also kind of difficult if you have to restrict by, you know, an amount more than 10 or 20% below your normal requirements. Mm. So you can, but it's very difficult to, to do and not many people are very effective at it. And one more thing on that subject, there becomes a point of diminishing return. So, you know, mm. especially when someone's been dieting for a little while, and let's say you've lost a lot of weight, maybe more than 10% of your body weight from start to finish, which is quite a bit. You might start adding in more movement. So let's say you've got a coach and they say, okay, well, we've stopped losing weight. We've hit a plateau. Uh, I want you to do another uh, 30 minutes um, of exercise. I want you to go and ride, ride a bike outside hard for 30 minutes or do the stair meal or a boxing class, whatever it is. So, you know, you, you might go ahead and do that class, but once our body is in this, I guess, uh, unfavorable environment, hormonally, physiologically, psychologically, um, we don't have the same output. It's not like with every additional 30 minutes or so of exercise that I add to try and do more, yeah. I don't get right. the same return on investment. You know, those following subsequent sessions um, and the more our metabolism is trying to slow us down from losing more weight, the less energy we expend. So that's what I mean by, you know, we start to see diminishing returns. That first 30 minutes that you do of exercise might burn 300 calories, but 12 weeks into a diet, adding in another 30, you might not be getting 300 calories. You might have a suppressed metabolism um, and you're no longer as efficient um, or you, sorry, you become more efficient rather uh, at that movement. That's a very nice and elaborated answer, I, I, I would say, right? <clears throat> um, you know, before I was preparing uh, to the interview, uh, I was reading some stats here and there about the eating disorders and I was shocked. 9% of the US uh, population are in this category. They fall into the uh, having eating disorder. It's 10,000 and also 10,200 deaths each year because of it. And about mm-hmm. 26% of these people with eating disorder attempt suicide. This, this was mm-hmm. shocking to me. And, um, and you've personally experienced eating disorder. So I would like to ask you, could you please share more about your personal journey of overcoming eating disorder? Yeah, those statistics are crazy. And I think if I'm being perfectly honest, they are probably much higher and they're higher in women, more prevalent in women. Uh, I think there's been uh, a pretty big movement in general, which is something that I am really happy about um, as far as being in the fitness industry. Uh, And that is that more and more people are kind of, um, you know, sharing their testimonials, they're sharing their stories, their experiences, Um, and thankfully some of these are the people that have kind of done the work they've healed or they are going through their healing journey, uh, and they're big, um, spokespeople for, you know, bringing more awareness to this issue because it is, uh, extremely concerning to see the numbers, uh, and I guess the, the unfortunate side effects. And you mentioned, you know, the, uh, attempted suicides and things like that. And I can tick all of those boxes. Um, I, when I was young and, you know, I was telling you earlier about my choices to kind of get into the education system, um, you know, and, and, and do everything that I do. And it really all started from having an eating disorder. But mm. I, I think it's also really important to understand, at least in my, my journey, you know, wh- why do I have one? Where did this come from? Um, and in a lot of therapy, a lot of work, and I'm talking like consistent weekly therapy appointments for years. So in 2016, I started getting therapy. It was the first time I 
really took matters into my own hands. It was like, I am radically accepting what I have. I am taking full uh, responsibility for what I have going on and I want to change. And it took four years to really get to the other side of this. So it's not an easy journey. But through all of that um, work, I kind of discovered that it was from, you know, trauma from my childhood. So I won't go into all of those details because I don't know that it's really necessary. There's certainly plenty of stuff online that you can find about, you know, what all of that, what happened. But um, I, I know that my eating disorder was a symptom of trauma. So um, I guess my my reason for getting into health and fitness and nutrition was because it was the only thing at the time, you know, when I was a 15 or 16 year old girl um, that I felt I had any control over. Uh, I didn't have a great relationship with my mother. Um, I had a, a poor, if any, relationship with my father. Um, and I, I didn't have a lot of positive influences or mentors. I was raised in an agnostic family and in an agnostic community. So I didn't really have any, you know, spiritual guidance or anything like this. It was really just my mum doing the best that she could, uh, you know, trying to raise two girls and, you know, it's a, it's a vicious world. And I, I think that, you know, it, it really led to a 15 year long eating disorder, um, I I was raised in a way where I kind of felt like I had to be perfect at everything. Uh, so I'd say I was a perfectionist, a people pleaser. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I did everything right. I, you know, I was uh, very high standards for myself. And, you know, that kind of carried over into my, uh, you know, early adulthood and then all through, you know, the early part of my 20s. And, you know, getting into bodybuilding in many ways was the worst thing that I could have ever done. It was basically, uh, it gave me an excuse to, to restrict. It gave me an excuse to, mm. you know, be extreme uh, and no one could question me. And that went on for a long time. And I, I am so glad that I got to this point where I, you know, I had had enough. I, I was suicidal. And again, this was like when I was back in my 15 and 16 year old self, um, due to a number of different circumstances had tried to or attempted suicide uh, and was, you know, clinically depressed. It was, it was horrible. And I think it took me a long time to not be ashamed and embarrassed, especially having gone to school for dietetics. Like here's me, this person that's meant to know everything about food, like, and oh, you're in great shape. What could possibly be wrong with you? Um, right. Meanwhile, like up here in my mind, there was just horrible, um, you know, critical, uh, you know, this, this self that, you know, hated every single part of me. And, you know, the only, I guess, validation or a way of me feeling acceptable was through having a lean physique. And then also being in the nutrition industry, I think there was, uh, I guess, a standard where if you didn't look the part, then how would anyone possibly take you seriously? It's almost like who trusts a skinny chef, you know? So <laughs> I, I kind of carried all these beliefs with me for a really long time and um, through lots of therapy, lots of reading uh, and really taking, like I said, that radical responsibility um, to, you know, basically throw myself at um, self-development, um, growth mindset, changing my habits, changing my behaviors, reading about leadership, uh, how I can be more productive, how I can be successful. Um, like all of those, um, you know, lessons through reading, through courses, through just self-education kind of got me to this place where I was like, enough is enough. I, I want to be someone else. And, you know, I had to be so, so intentional with every decision that I made um, to kind of get me through um, to realize I am enough. I, I don't have to look like this. I am worthy. I deserve love. I deserve to be, you know, to offer myself self-compassion and kindness. And it took years. And then I finally kind of was able to, you know, break through uh, and see myself for who I was. And I am so glad and so grateful for all the experiences that I've had, because I know I wouldn't be the person that I am today had I not gone through the worst of it. <laughs> so I know that was a really long uh, kind of response, but uh, I'm sure there are probably some follow-up things that you, you want to talk about. Well, well, Holly, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. And of course, I know you shared with your with your audience as well. And I, I, I want to thank you for that because, you know, you've 
you're helping so many people out there just sharing these stories, but you're doing obviously above and beyond that. And it's so important. So my, my question to that is going to be for someone who's listening right now, who may be struggling with either body image issues or eating disorders, mm -hmm. what is one actionable thing that they can take right after this podcast, right? It's like, Hey, you're listening to this. Mm -hmm. I want you to take this next action. Just do it. What would that be? What is that therapy? Because obviously that is a, mm -hmm. that's a big theme that we've been hearing, but, or, or is that, you know, is, is that a high barrier for most people? What's something actionable that somebody can consider without, you know, feeling this mm -hmm. overwhelming anxiety? I think first and foremost, you have to, you have to want to change your, the, I think there's this, an expression like the pain of how you feel now has to outweigh the pain of change. Um, and that's really where people start to make, you know, big, de uh, big decisions in their life. So I think sometimes people may have to go a little further into this feeling of emptiness alone, um, unhappiness, like all of the, the horrible emotions that come along with, with having or being trapped in this, this space of a disordered eating or an eating disorder uh, before they, they're ready. And I know that there was a period of time where I needed to, I needed to get to the bottom before. And that's just not how some people learn. It's like some people have to find mm -hmm. rock bottom before they are ready yeah. to make change. And then they are the ones usually that have the highest <laughs> recoveries uh, and the most incredible, you know, testimonies. But I think that um, beyond wanting to see change and wanting to feel differently about yourself, um, I think actionable steps, if you're in that space, would be uh, stop following people on social media. So that was one of the first steps that I, I took. I basically had to go back down to zero. Um, I removed myself from any material that kind of made me feel insecure or uh, uncomfortable or ashamed or that I wasn't enough. So, you know, you can imagine that's a big, like for a female, I remember having to wipe out, like even some of my girlfriends at the time. And I, I remember saying them, to them at the time, hey, this is nothing against you. This is, this is me. And I am dealing with myself right now. I love you, but this is something that I have to do if I want to get healthy. So I think really um, recognizing the impact that social media can have on how you feel. Uh, and then second step that is an easy free thing that you can do is start following people that are body positivity, that are, you know, uh, body positive or even just weight neutral, um, or they see themselves as more than an object or just more than their bodies. Um, they're not kind of posting, you know, uh, selfies and, you know, body based, um, you know, imagery. I think that was a really powerful tool for me because then it gave me hope that, wow, I can get through this. There are other people that have struggled in this, you know, low self-worth, low self-value, um, uh, you know, lifestyle that are seem to be thriving and just so happy. And there are lots of people that exist. You just have to go into your search terms and, you know, look up um, body positive and you will find some incredible, you know, accounts to follow. Um, again, speaking to, you know, from an affordability um, standpoint, because, you know, therapy is expensive. I mean, back then when I first started, it was like, it's $150 a session for, you know, a mm. good therapist. So, you know, that is not always accessible to everybody. So that may be for me, one of the reasons why I put it off for so long, because that's a big expense, or it wasn't an expense yeah. that I was willing to um, uh, put up if I had other things that were, you know, more important to me at the time. And that's why I say I probably could have afforded therapy back then, but I know that I wasn't ready to change. I didn't want to, I wasn't unhappy yeah. enough to, to do anything about it. So I think books, audibles, YouTube, there are so many more people these days that are giving away free information or extremely affordable education. Um, there are so many courses that you can do. I know uh, Evelyn Trimbley is one of the uh, in uh, one of the the leading uh, experts on um, mindful eating practices. So, kind of not. I, I'm not a fan of the anti diet culture because I think there is still a need for, uh, I guess, individuals to you know break free of emotional eating. And I think a lot of people that are in this space of obesity or have a really unhealthy body weight um, may mm. struggle with a lot of these emotional eating disorders. Um, 
But I, I think that getting into, you know, a practice or a community that isn't focused on appearances and that allows you to focus on all of your other values and the things that are worthy about you and a, a little, I guess, homework task that I'll have my clients do uh, is write down like 10 things that you're really proud of or that you like about yourself. And it might be, you know, I'm a talented musician or uh, I have a wonderful, big, funny personality or, you know, I'm really good at um, showing empathy and caring and, you know, I'm, I'm a kind person. So, you know, there's lots of things that you can do, I think, proactively to start recognizing that you are more than just your body. Um, and then again, thinking about what's free, what can I do uh, right now? Uh, affirmations and mantras. They seem corny and I can tell you now I was the first person, like I'm coming from a like science space. I'm like, mantras, please. <laughs> and, you know, I used to laugh about some of these things, but, you know, I was at a place where I was also like, I don't have any other options right now. So, you know, finding a few mantras or affirmations that you can stick up, like I have sticky notes and this is not a good example but like I have sticky notes when I started this pr uh, process everywhere I had them on my pantry my fridge I'd have whiteboard chalky markers that you could use on your mirror in your bathroom to remind me that I am enough and that I can do this I've got this so you know taking those things to your workspace places that you spend lots of time um to put sink it in and you know the brain is extremely neuroplastic we have this ability to change our minds uh, in fact there's a, a really great book by dr carolyn leaf which is called how to switch on your brain um, and she is a, a neuroscientist and some of her studies are fantastic i mean she goes through uh, I guess, uh, multiple different study interventions or randomized control trials where we look at people that have or suffer with depression or anxiety. Uh, and then, you know, after the, the trial, the study intervention, where all they're doing is working with a therapist on changing the thoughts that they allow, that they put into their mind. And then, you know, we see uh, on these MRI scans at the end of the study intervention, like basically the areas that would light up in response to trauma or fear or, you know, any of those kind of negative emotions are basically gone. You know, they, these people are now, they're no longer wow. clinically depressed. Uh, and it's all through doing the work. Uh, another individual that I love um, who has multiple books is Dr. Nicole LaPera. Um, she's a psychologist and uh, I guess has a similar story to me actually uh, and has been able to overcome, you know, all of these really um, unfavorable, like dysfunctional thoughts uh, and beliefs about herself. And now she kind of educates about that. So, you know, I, I think probably six things that I've just said are all like under 50 bucks or free that you can do today to get yourself into a better space and really like reclaim your life. You can break free of an eating disorder, but damn, you've got to want it. Wow. Thank you so much for that great advice. Definitely a lot of great actionable advice from you. And I really, really love uh, when you mentioned uh, about writing 10 positive things about you, whether or not you have an eating disorder, whether you're a fitness expert or you don't care about your diet, if you're listening, I think that's a great exercise for just us as humans. We, we tend to forget, you know, we don't have it on the conscious level, you know, like, hey, I'm great at this mm -hmm. and I'm great at that. And I can even write something as simple as I love my wife, or <laughs> love my kids, right? Like just writing that myself. down can this remind is also you. Yeah. Big one. I, well, I, I, yes, yes, exactly. So definitely, definitely uh, great, great advice. And I also think the biggest, the biggest mover here that Holly mentioned is that you have to be, I mean, you have to want to do it. It's because a lot of people, they just love to be in depression. They're just sitting there, they're enjoying their depression and they're going more mm -hmm. and more and more. So you have to allow yourself be there. But at some point you should believe in yourself and, you know, start doing action. So mm -hmm. when, when you, when you started going to uh, taking therapy, it was your decision or somebody pushed you to go. Um, it was probably a combination of both. I think I had enough um, supports in my life at the time that kind of said, you know, we see you struggle with this, um, you know, we want you to get better, but, you know, ultimately it, it, this is your decision. And uh, I think for the first year of therapy, I remember 
every time I knew I had a call scheduled, I'd get anxiety. I'd feel sick. I remember like canceling, you know, probably one in three sessions because I was like, oh, this is stupid. It's not going to work. And that's because I'd had, you know, an unsuccessful uh, attempts at therapy, you know, in the past. And I will say, I think it takes a little while to find somebody that you can really connect with. So, you know, if you if you haven't had a, a positive experience or you don't feel like, um, you know, there's motivation or a connection between the person you've been, you know, consulting with, you know, find somebody else. There's so many, you know, incredible therapists doing work out there. Uh, and, you know, some of these are people that have like they've lived this life, they've they've experienced this themselves and they are on the other side. So being able to relate, you know, personally with, with somebody uh, and what you're going through, I think uh, makes it that much more, um, you know, believable. Like I, I know for me, the, the person that I worked with was, was in that very situation and, you know, she would relate some of the things that we would do to her experiences um, and I know that kind of brought a closer, more intimate relationship. Um, ultimately, you know, the therapy is about you, but I, I really think that there's value in finding the right person. Um, and, you know, sometimes people will motivate you. You never know. Like sometimes you don't have any any intention of making change because of just how this person is or how they approach the, the homework or the therapy. Um, but, you know, for me, I know that, something just changed in me with the individual that I was working with. And I know I had already, I'd hit rock bottom and I was ready. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that is, that's a really important piece too. Holly, I want to ask you one last question before we wrap up, <laughs> just who has been the, one of the most strongest or most inspiring person in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? That is a good question. You know what? I I don't know that I have any one individual that has really been a, you know, a, a game changer for me. Um, I think that there's probably a number of different authors, researchers that, you know, have inspired me. Um, I think if I was to reel off a bunch of authors and then you guys can go and check these books out, but and I'm, maybe your listeners have, have read them already. Read them again. There are so many books I've read more than once. Like Simon Sinek, you know, he's got Start With Why, uh, Leaders Eat Last. Mm. So these are more like leadership success type uh, individuals and authors. Um, James Clear, Atomic Habits. Um, goodness, uh, Jen Sincero, she's got Badass Habits. And that was one of the uh, books that I read initially to kind of break some of my crappy habits. And I also found out I had ADD, you know, late last year, which was like such a relief. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not stupid after all. <laughs> like I thought for the longest time there was something wrong with me. I'm like, oh, actually, you know what? I have this thing, which makes it so much harder for me. So it allowed me to extend empathy and compassion because I now understood why. So Badass Habits was a really good one for habit change. Um, Gary Keller, The One Thing, that was a great educational success productivity book that I've read. Um, Jim Collins, Good to Great. I mentioned two of my favorite therapists or researchers, uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Uh, she is the book, How to Switch on Your Brain. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Nicole Lapera, uh, her book's called Do the Work fantastic. Like all of those books are not directly related to eating disorders, but they're all related to, you know, as I mentioned, habits, behavior change, leadership, productivity, self-development, growing yourself, like desiring to be the best version of you. So, you know, they're authors and researchers that I look up to. So I, I don't have one person. There are many collectively that I think have really shaped, um, you know, the person that I am now. Holly, thank you so much for that answer. And thank you so much for your time. I'd love to ask you one last question, actually, which is, can you please let our let our audience know? And of course, all the information will be down in the description below. Mm -hmm. But where can they find you and any, I don't know, any upcoming <laughs> exciting news that you have? I know, obviously, you have the, the August 14th and 15th conference coming up in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I also know that you just got a brand new kitten. So congratulations. <laughs> Holly just got a kitten. Who looks who looks magnificent just yesterday so that's very exciting uh, but yeah please let it please let our audience know uh any exciting things that are coming up with you yeah and where they can so you. i have actually just launched a brand new book uh, it is called the complete exercise guide to muscle hypertrophy so it is a, a research-based book uh that really kind of um breaks down uh, complex science and makes it easy to understand for the layperson so 
uh, it would be appropriate for not only coaches, men and women uh, that are looking to kind of maximize or optimize the way that they do things, but also for individuals who just want good information because there is so much bad information out there at the moment. Um, so my new book is available. Uh, that's all on my website and everything that I do, my coaching team, my carbon uh, diet coach app, uh, our training apps, all of those things are available by just going to my Instagram handle, uh, which is Holly T Baxter. Uh, everything is linked right there. <laughs> Holly, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me.